It used to be easy to find out what science was. Sixty years ago, almost all of my science books started with Science is that branch of the search for knowledge which follows the scientific method. Well, what is the scientific method? It was put forward by Francis Bacon in 1620. It's the only sure way to search for the truth about any phenomenon or process in nature. He gives the reason for proposing it. Nature carries the stamp of the creator, whereas man's reason carries the stamp of his own folly. We will have it that all things are as we think they should be. So to guard against our thinking things are the way we think they should be, his method insists on seven distinct steps. First, careful observation and measurement. Two, searching for patterns in the observations and measurements. Three, a hypothesis to explain these patterns. Four, critical experiments to test the hypothesis. Five, if experiments do not support the hypothesis, then look for a new one. Six, if much experimental evidence supports and none contradicts, it can be considered a scientific theory. And seven, if any observation contradicts a theory or hypothesis, it must be abandoned. We can see why Dmitry Mendeleev said, science begins with measurement. And Albert Einstein said, what can be measured is science, everything else is speculation. The scientific method was introduced in 1620. Does that mean that there was no science before that time? Well, there was a deficient kind of proto-science, and perhaps the most famous example was in ancient Greece. But there was a reason why they couldn't do real science. They had a pantheon of gods and goddesses who sometimes quarrelled among themselves. They sometimes had affairs with handsome heroes or fair damsels, and they got involved with the creation in capricious ways. To do experiments might risk getting involved with the gods and getting into big trouble. The Greeks made observations and measurements. They made hypotheses to explain the observations, but they did not do experiments to test them. Pythagoras put forward a hypothesis about the notes ringing from hammers of various weights. The hypothesis was wrong, but he never found out because he never did an experiment to test it. Aristotle, perhaps the greatest philosopher of all time, proposed a system of physics which was believed for about 2,000 years. His physics was taught in all the universities of Europe until the Reformation, when the scientific method was introduced. People did experiments, like dropping a cannonball and a musket ball from the Leaning Tower of Pisa. Aristotle said the heavier would fall faster. They both fell at the same speed. Science proved that Greek proto-science was a failure. It was even more impossible for science to develop in India and the Far East, where millions of gods and goddesses rule every aspect of nature. Mathematics developed there, but to expect unchanging natural laws would be utterly illogical. So there was no chance of science developing in the Far East, and science couldn't develop in Africa. To the people of Africa, nature was ruled by spirits, and the spirits were conjured by witches and witch doctors. To expect that things would be the same in one village as in another would be unthinkable. There were different spirits in each village, and those spirits were conjured by different witches and witch doctors. One might have thought that science could develop among the Muslims, since they had only one god. But Allah is unpredictable. He can suddenly decide to do something new or different, any time he chooses. Again, universal unchanging laws of nature wouldn't be expected. The Muslims made some progress in mathematics, just like the Greeks and the Indians. They also preserved Greek proto-science, 
taken from the great library of Alexandria before burning it to the ground, but they made very little advance themselves. In fact, it was only under the Judeo-Christian worldview that science could ever come about. At the time of the Reformation, the printing press was invented. The prime use of Gutenberg's press was to print the Bible. People read the Bible and wanted to know more about the God they found there. They read of a reasonable God. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. They read of a law-giving God. The law of the Lord is perfect. I shall keep your law, indeed I shall observe it with my whole heart. A consistent God who remains the same eternally. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today and forever. The Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. They read that his attributes can be seen in his creation. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. And they were convinced that they could learn more about him by studying his creation. Under this worldview, it made sense to expect that nature would be ruled by unchanging laws and that careful examination would allow those laws to be discovered. An amazing group of very talented Christian scholars, filled with Reformation inspiration, started examining the creation using the scientific method. Johannes Kepler, Isaac Newton and many others, as we'll see next time. Thank you for joining me for this episode. If you enjoyed it, please like, subscribe and press the bell so that you'll be notified as I release new movies. If you'd like to support this project, you're welcome to do so through Patreon. Find a link on my channel banner and in the description below.